Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the FactSet Ford Fiscal Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press the start and the one key on your touchstone telephone. Please be advised that today's conference may be recorded. If you recall all assistance, please press start and zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker host today, Rima Hyder. Please go ahead. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to FactSet's fourth fiscal quarter 2021 earnings call. We continue to be in various remote locations today. We may have some audio quality issues and we appreciate your patience should we experience a disruption. Before we begin, I would like to point out that the slides we will reference during this presentation can be accessed via the webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at factset.com. The slides will be posted on our website at the conclusion of this call. A replay of today's call will be available via phone and on our website. After our prepared remarks, we will open the call to questions from investors. To be fair to everyone, please limit yourself to one question plus one follow-up. Before we discuss our results, I encourage all listeners to review the legal notice on slide two, which explains the risks of forward-looking statements and the use of non-GAAP financial measures. Additionally, please refer to our forms 10-K and 10-Q for a discussion of risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements. Our slide presentation and discussions on this call will include certain non-GAAP financial measures. For such measures, reconciliation to the most directly comparable gap measures are in the appendix to the presentation and in our earnings release issued earlier today. Joining me today are Phil Snow, Chief Executive Officer, and Helen Chan, Chief Financial Officer and Chief Revenue Officer. And now I'd like to turn the discussion over to Phil Snow. Thank you, Rima, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm pleased to share that we delivered strong fourth quarter and full year results. We ended the year with record organic ASV plus professional services growth of $68 million for the quarter, crossing the $100 million annual ASV threshold for the first time and soundly beating the top end of our guidance. Our year-on-year -year organic ASV growth rate accelerated 200 basis points to over 7%, and we delivered annual revenue of $1.6 billion, an adjusted EPS of $11.20. Our outperformance was driven by two years of planned, accelerated investment in content and technology, which is paying dividends. FactSet's goal to be the leading open content and analytics platform is resonating in the marketplace and increasing our wallet share with clients. Our targeted investment in new content sets was a significant ASV driver in fiscal 21 and fueled our workstation growth. The continued development of our deep sector coverage improved sell-side retention and expansion with our largest banking clients and helped secure a new business. Content and technology were both key to our expansion with wealth management firms where we landed important wins, including with the Royal Bank of Canada and Raymond James Canada. These wins were due to our market-leading data and the launch of FactSet's advisor dashboard. We are also expanding our addressable market by increasing our content and delivery capabilities across the front, middle, and back office. We added meaningful ASV from our cloud and API solutions this year, including delivering more data through the cloud and cloud-based platforms, entity mapping and linking client data through our data management services, or DMS, and unlocking opportunity in new workflows by unbundling our components to plug and play into other third-party systems, such as CRMs. Cloud delivery coupled with the strength of our DMS and concordance as a service Solutions enable our clients to centralize, integrate, and analyze disparate data sources 
for faster and more cost-effective decision-making. This has been a major driver for our CTS business. As we look ahead to 2022 and beyond, we remain focused on three things. Scaling up our content refinery to provide the most comprehensive and connected set of industry, proprietary, and third-party data for the financial market. Two, enhancing the client experience by delivering hyper-personalized solutions so clients can discover meaningful insights faster. And third, driving next-generation workflow-specific solutions for asset managers, asset owners, sell-side wealth management, and corporate clients. We added new data and capabilities to further these goals by acquiring differentiated assets over the past year. The addition of True Value Labs has grown our ESG offering. BTU Analytics advanced our deep sector content for the energy markets, and Cabot Technologies will better support the portfolio analytics workflows of asset managers and asset owners. The progress we have made on our investment plan, along with these acquisitions and our award-winning products, give us a distinct competitive advantage. Turning now to our financial results, we accelerated our organic ASV plus professional services growth to 7.2%. Our strong performance was driven by stellar execution from our sales and client-facing teams throughout the entire year, and especially in the fourth quarter. Our buy-side and sell-side growth rates increased 100 and 400 basis points, respectively, since the third quarter, reflecting higher sales across our key clients. On a year-over-year basis, we saw an increase in ASV growth rates from high single-digit to double digits across banks, asset owners, hedge funds, data providers, wealth managers, and corporates, including private equity and venture capital firms. We capitalized on the strength of our end markets, particularly in banking, and landed several large deals in our wealth and CTS businesses. Turning now to our geographic segments, we saw acceleration in every region. ASV growth in the Americas rose to 7% in the fourth quarter, driven primarily by increased sales to our banking, corporate, and wealth clients. We also had a large data partner win this quarter in CTS. Asia-Pac had a record ASV quarter and delivered a growth rate of 12%. We saw wins across many countries with global and regional banks, as well as our research management products. CTS and analytics also contributed to growth with wins across asset managers and data providers. EMEA accelerated to a 6% growth rate driven by strong performance with data providers, asset managers, and banking clients, and CTS had the highest contribution to this region followed by research. Now turning to our businesses, research was the largest contributor to our ASV growth this year with a growth rate of 6%, driven by very strong growth on the sell side at 12%. We increased research workstation users by 86% this quarter versus a year ago with growth across both sell side and buy side clients. Increasing our workstation presence and footprint with our largest clients positions us very well for cross-selling opportunities in the future. Analytics and trading accelerated in the second half in fiscal 2021 versus the first half, ending the year at a 6% growth rate. We saw wins across performance and reporting, front office, and core analytics solutions. Within front office solutions, we are really pleased to see larger wins with our trading platform and believe this will be a contributor to analytics going into next year. CTS grew 16%, driven by core company data and data management solutions sold through an increasing number of channels. CTS had robust sales to data providers this year and expanded their footprint across multiple workflows within middle and back office functions at asset management and banking clients. Additionally, while all True Value Labs ESG sales are excluded from our organic numbers, I'm pleased to report that ESG data sales were a contributor to CTS's overall growth this quarter. Wealth ended the year with a 6% growth rate. Wealth workstations grew 24% year over year, and they, alongside FactSet's advisor dashboard, have been the biggest contributors to winning new clients. We've seen a combination of large and medium-sized wins as existing clients continue to expand their advisory businesses, and we are equally pleased with our new business wins. 
We are also seeing cross-selling opportunities with analytics products as wealth managers increasingly look to advance the sophistication of their offerings. Moving forward with fiscal 22, we will report three workflow solutions. We are combining the desktop portion of the wealth business with research into one business to be known as research and advisory. We believe this is the right strategy to further our goals to holistically manage our desktop solutions, accelerate the build out of differentiated front office solutions, and facilitate the global expansion and adoption of street account news and facts at web. We have also taken the wealth digital business and combined it with CTS to better align our digital solutions. In summary, we are entering fiscal 22 with strong momentum and a solid pipeline as reflected in our annual ASV guidance. The need for more differentiated content and analytics is at an unprecedented high, and we are perfectly positioned to capture this demand and poised to deliver best-in-class workflows and a hyper-personalized experience for our clients. I'm proud of our company's strong performance in fiscal 21. We have advanced our digital platform executed at a high level, and strengthened our relationship with clients. I'll now turn it over to Helen, who for the last time as CFO will discuss our fourth quarter and full year performance in more detail and take you through our fiscal 2022 guidance. I want to thank Helen for leading our global finance organization the past three years, and I'm confident that as our chief revenue officer, she will bring a disciplined, growth-oriented mindset and the same rigor to the sales organization as she did leading finance, enabling us to continue our success going forward. Thank you, Phil, and hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today, and I hope that we will continue to engage even after I fully transition to my sales role. Like Phil, I want to congratulate fact setters around the world for achieving outstanding results in fiscal 2021. While we have continued primarily to operate remotely, I am so impressed with the resilience with which our FactSet teams are able to serve our global clients. Our 7% top-line growth this year is a testament to the hard work of our teams and validates our strategy to invest in content and technology, capitalize on market trends, and address client needs. Throughout this fiscal year, we accelerated our growth rate in ASV plus professional services through consistent conversion of our pipeline, delivering over 100 million in ASV growth and surpassing our most recent guidance for the year. Full year revenue also exceeded our target as we realized more revenue from ASV booked early in the fourth quarter. We generated solid earnings through disciplined expense management and operating leverage. Driving sustainable long-term growth requires continued investment back into the business, as reflected by our increased spend on differentiated content and cloud-enabled technology. We executed our plan well, and our operating results are in line with expectations due to higher revenue and productivity gains, with higher adjusted operating income and growth in adjusted EPS. Let me now walk you through the specifics of our fourth quarter. Before I explain the quarterly results, I want to remind everyone that our prior year fourth quarter gap results were impacted by a one-time non-cash charge of approximately $17 million related to an impairment of an investment in a third party. Thus, any year-over-year comparison of gap operating results for the fourth quarter of 2021 should take that into consideration. As you saw on the previous slide, our organic ASV plus professional services growth rate was 7.2%. This increase reflects the higher demand for our solutions as clients execute on their own digital transformations. Our success in solving their workflow challenges has resulted in higher levels of both client retention and cross-selling activity. For the quarter, gap revenue increased by 7% to $412 million. Organic revenue which excludes any impact from foreign exchange, acquisitions, and deferred revenue amortization, also increased 7% to $410 million. Growth was driven by our analytics, CTS, and research solutions. For our geographic segments, organic revenue for the Americas grew to 6%, EMEA grew to 7%, 
and Asia Pacific to 12%. All regions primarily benefited from increases in our analytics and CTS solutions. GAAP operating expenses grew 3% in the fourth quarter to $293 million, impacted by a higher cost of services. Compared to the previous year, our GAAP operating margin increased by 320 basis points to 28.9%, and our adjusted operating margin decreased by 150 basis points to 31.6%. As a percentage of revenue, our cost of services was 10 basis points higher than last year on a GAAP basis and flat to last year on an adjusted basis. The increase is primarily driven by growth in compensation comprised of higher salary expenses for existing employees, new hires to support a multi-year investment plan, and higher bonus accrual in line with stronger than anticipated ASV performance. SG&A expenses, when expressed as a percentage of revenue, improved year-over-year by 330 basis points on a gap basis, but increased 170 basis points on an adjusted basis. The primary drivers include higher compensation costs, reflecting the same factors as noted in the cost of services. Moving on, our tax rate for the quarter was 15%, higher than the prior year's tax rate of 7%, primarily due to lower tax benefits associated with stock-based compensation in the current quarter, as well as a tax benefit related to finalizing the prior year's tax returns. GAAP EPS increased 15% to $2.63 this quarter versus $2.29 in the prior year. Again, this improvement is primarily a result of the impairment charge we recorded in the fourth quarter of 2020. Adjusted diluted EPS remained flat year-over-year at $2.88. Adjusted EPS was driven by higher revenues, offset by higher operating expenses, and an increase in the tax rate. A reconciliation of our adjustments to GAAP EPS is included at the end of our press release. Free cash flow, which we define as cash generated from operations, less capital spending, was $171 million for the quarter, an increase of 18% over the same period last year. This increase is primarily due to higher net income, improved collections, and the timing of certain tax payments. For the fourth quarter, our ASV retention remained above 95%, and our client retention improved to 91%, which again speaks to the demand for our solutions and excellent execution by our sales teams. Compared to the prior year, we grew our total number of clients by 10% to over 6,400, largely due to the addition of more wealth and corporate clients and our user count grew 14% year over year and crossed the total of 160,000, primarily driven by sales in our wealth and research solutions and, in particular, in the number of banking users. For the quarter, we repurchased over 265,000 shares of our common stock at a total cost of $93 million, with an average share price of $348. For the year, we purchased $265 million of our shares and increased our dividend for the 22nd consecutive year. With share repurchases and dividends on an annual basis, we have returned to shareholders almost 70% as a percentage of free cash flow and proceeds from employee stock options. We remain disciplined in our buyback program and committed to returning long-term value to our shareholders. Turning now to our outlook for fiscal year 2022, we delivered outstanding results in the back half of 2021 and believe this pace will carry into our next fiscal year. For organic ASV plus professional services, we are guiding to an incremental $105 to $135 million. The midpoint of this range represents a 7% increase which is equal to this year's organic growth rate, reflecting continued momentum in our business. We are confident in our ability to perform at the high standard we demonstrated in fiscal 21 with underlying drivers to include discipline execution and continued benefits from our investments. We expect growth to be driven largely with existing clients through high retention and cross-selling. 
In addition, we expect our ability to successfully sell new business in this virtual environment to continue. Our recent investments in digital and content are providing us with more opportunities to sell direct solutions tailored for specific workflows. Drivers of future growth would include, first, the retention and expansion of our sell-side client base through our deep sector strategy as we launch new targeted industries in addition to new private markets offerings. Second, new wins with wealth managers who have been responding well to our web-based workstation and personalized advisor dashboard. And third, growth with institutional asset management clients who benefit from our data management solutions and enhanced capabilities in front office and ESG workflows. We are mindful about the global environment and potential future market disruptions, but we believe we have the right offerings and strategy to maintain our high performance and growth rate into fiscal 2022. From an operational perspective, we plan for continued labor productivity and operating leverage. In addition to our multi-year investment plan, new investments will be made in content and front office solutions, funded in part by ongoing cost discipline, including permanent savings related to the pandemic and additional efficiency actions. As a result of higher growth in revenues and continued cost discipline, we are guiding to an expansion in our operating margins. Combined with our consistent use of capital for share repurchases, we expect to accelerate growth in our diluted EPS, both on a gap and adjusted basis. We are seeing the results of our investments take hold in both technology and content. As we look to fiscal 2022, we are focused on delivering more value to clients, prioritizing our resources, and ensuring execution excellence. As I transition to my new role, I am seeing firsthand the experience and skills of our sales team in adapting to meet the needs of the market. Our client-centric mentality, combined with our expanding data universe and digital advances, provide me with the confidence that we have the people, strategy, and product to build a leading open content and analytics platform in our industry, all while generating long-term value for our shareholders. With that, we are now ready for your questions, and I'll turn it over to the operator. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to ask a question at this time, you will need to press the star then the one key on your touchdown telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. In fairness to all participants, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And I'll now, first question coming from the line of Ashish Sabadra with RBC Capital Market. Your line is open. Thanks. Uh, congrats on such a solid quarter and, and, and a s impressive guidance. Um, my question uh, more on the research side. Uh, this is the first uh, year where we've seen such a massive acceleration to 6%. As, uh, as you mentioned, your deep content as well as technology transformation bearing fruit. I was wondering if you could provide more color. It looks like it's been driven by new wins, client retention, but if you can just talk about how do we think about this research and advisory growth going forward, is that kind of growth sustainable given uh, your deep sector strategy? Thanks. Hi, Ashish. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we're very pleased with how our research business performed this year. Uh, clearly, we had very good performance on the sell side and the investment that we made in new content uh, really helped drive new lo logos, expansion of existing clients, and helped with retention. So that was a big driver on the sell side. Uh, however, the research business grew at a healthy clip uh, in lots of different firm types. So we did very well on a relative basis to last year with in institutional asset management. Uh, we did well with corporates, hedge funds, um, a number of different firm types. So it was pretty broad-based. Uh, you can see that we grew our workstations um, by, I think, 14% over the last year. So just getting that footprint is really important for us moving forward to cross-sell. Um, we closed lots of new logos. So my hat's off to the research team. They've done an amazing job and just really a, a monster quarter from the sales team in terms of going out and executing on of all the opportunities we had in front of us. 
That's very helpful, color. Thank you. And maybe just a question on margins. Again, great to see margin expansion despite the investments. And uh, my question was more uh, over the midterm. As you retire your data center, first the question is, are you still on track to retire the data centers by end of fiscal 22? And how should we think about the cost savings as you get rid of some of the redundant cost and get back to a more normalized investment cycle? Thanks. Hi, it's Helen. Thanks for that uh, for that question. Yes, as it relates to the um, status of our our investment plan, we we remain uh, on track. Uh, we're obviously um, being a, uh, able to, as we've t- talked about in the past, to be doing our transformation and transition to the cloud, and that remains on track as well. And so we do expect to complete most of what we expected to. Uh, to, to get out of the data centers by year end, but we'll, obviously we'll see how the year progresses, but there's nothing right now that uh, changes our view. That's helpful. Thanks again, uh, and congrats on the solid quarter. Yeah, thank you. And our next question coming from the lineup, Kevin McVeigh with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Great. Thanks so much, and let me add my congratulations as well. Hey, um, for 22, the guide, can you unpack maybe a little bit, Helen, how are you thinking about new logos versus additional client offerings, and then just any any thoughts as to the client retention? Because, again, you're seeing a lot of success across multiple vectors, so just try to get a sense of, you know, the the buildup a little bit. Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks for your your question. So we've been very pleased with the way we've been able to execute uh, honestly, as uh, we think about from a year ago to, to now, I think what has been uh, extremely um, beneficial to us is our ability to grow with existing clients. So in the past, we've talked about two-thirds of the growth comes from existing, one-third from, from new. Uh, if we take a look at how the year actually progressed, we actually saw with existing clients the ability between retention and expansion to be nearly three-quarters of it. That doesn't mean that new business didn't grow. In fact, it grew at the same pace as in the past, Kevin. But what we saw was our ability from many of our investments to really resonate with our existing and even our largest clients. So we do look at new business going forward, continuing to do well. If I think about the course of the year, we actually had more in terms of volume. The average um, transaction price might be a, a bit lower, uh, but we made that up from volume, and I think that just reflects the virtual environment and the, and the situation that we're in. But it continues to be a, uh, a key part of our overall growth. That's great. And then just real quick, um, it looks like in September, Snowflake announced a, a new solution in the financial services data cloud. It probably brings more leverage in terms of what you're doing with them, but any updates as to how that impacts kind of the existing partnership you announced back in January, if at all? I think it's just consistent, um, Kevin, with what we've been doing with them and we're working with, you know, lots of different cloud providers to make sure that we provide uh, fact sets, data and analytics, you know, in the places that our clients want to consume it. So super happy with the Snowflake relationship. Uh, adding on services like Concordance will help us. Uh, and we do think that new channels like this are going to be important as we move forward. Great. Congrats again. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Vanath Patnaik with Barclays. Your line is open. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so I just had a question on the analytics business. You know, it's been, I, I guess, stuck at the 6 7% growth for the last couple of years. Is that uh, is that the right growth rate for this business, or is there any initiatives in there that could probably, you know, get that higher? Hey, Manav, thanks for the question. Uh, we certainly think analytics can do better. Uh, we did get off to a bit of a choppy start with analytics in the last fiscal year, and we attributed that to, <coughs> I think, sort of everyone getting their feet under them uh, as we learned how to work uh, through the pandemic. Uh, analytics had a much stronger second half. Uh, very good performance with our front office solutions, which include our portfolio management platform, uh, as well as our trading solutions. And analytics is setting up much better for next year. So we see um, like good pipeline for the first half and good pipeline uh, within the buy side, which, as you know, is where most of our analytics solutions are pointed. Got it. And then just on the research uh, uh, business, you know, 
can you just talk about uh, or help break out, you know, how much of that growth came from just, you know, new hiring on the sell side versus the rest on the buy side? And then I think you talked about winning some trading business. So can you just elaborate a bit on the trading side of, uh, of your offering? Sure. So, you know, we we think that we outperformed uh, significantly for three reasons. One is the investment in content and technology, uh, which we outlined, uh, the excellent performance of our front office uh, team. And then we'd say about a third of it probably was us really just capitalizing on uh, the strong trends in banking. Uh, so I probably attribute about a third of it to uh, the trends that are out there, and it's the work that we put in, though, that allowed us to capitalize on those trends. Uh, the trading business is really uh, the port web business that we acquired a few years ago. Uh, we had a very strong year. We closed some new logos, uh, and we increased our transaction revenue. I think a lot of that might have come from FX, so we've got a very strong uh, FX um, capabilities within our EMS. Yeah, Manav, I think right, it's important. In mind that the uh, that retention piece that Phil alluded to is, is really quite key. It, it is a, a a part of why research did so well this year. Appreciate that. Our next question coming from the line of Tony Kaplan with Mark and Stanley. Yelena Sulpin. Thank you. Um, wanted to focus on wealth. Um, the ASV was up. 6% organically year-over-year. Year. It's a little bit lighter than we've seen in the last few years. Um, you did mention that the work uh, the workstations in wealth was up in the mid-20% range. Um, so just hoping you could give some color on, on what sort of dragged the rest of wealth down. Thanks. Yeah, good, good question, Tony. Um, so you're absolutely right. The desktop business uh, grew significantly at 24%, and the ASV, um, X the digital solutions part of wealth, grew at about 10%. So we had uh, one large uh, deal that got canceled in February, which was a legacy digital solution uh, from the acquisition we did uh, many years ago, uh, not the type of solution that we're um, sort of upgrading our clients to these days. So that was something that was out there. It was with um, a large firm that was under financial stress uh, and something that was a headwind for us in Q2. You might have, rem I think I may have mentioned it in that quarter. We also had one other loss on the digital side, which was not related to wealth, but um, uh, another anticipated cancel. So in total, we might have had about $6 million in cancel from the old legacy digital business. Uh, so I would factor that in when you're thinking about our wealth business. But the new solutions we're focused on and how we're going to market now, uh, that was exceedingly healthy, uh, and I think bodes well as we go into next fiscal year. Got it. And just regarding removing the wealth disclosure in the future, I guess, you know, why are you doing that and how much is related to research versus CTS and if you could sort of give the growth rates of the pieces so that we know how much to impact uh, each of those segments by. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So it's just we've we've re realigned our business. So the wealth business, um, um, which was run by Goran Skoko, has now become research and advisory, which he'll be leading. Uh, you know, once Christy moved into the chief product officer role about a quarter ago. So really, there were two pieces to wealth. There was the web or workstation business, which which lines up nicely with our research uh, business line. And then there's the digital part of uh, wealth, which lines up very nicely with CTS. So there were really good synergies on the product and workflow side that we can capture uh, by organizing things this way. And the digital piece of wealth, uh, some new really good capabilities have been built there called FactSet Widgets, uh, which is in line with our open strategies. So um, I believe um, after the call you'll get – um, all of the numbers that uh, show you what the growth rates would have been this year for those three business lines, which I'm sure Rima will be happy to review with you later today. Perfect. Thanks. Yep. Now, our next question coming from the line of Hamza Mansari with Jeffrey Yolanda Sopin. Hi, this is Mario Cordolacci filling in for Hamza. Uh, my first question, um, just around, around sales, just could you comment on how much capacity and, and room for improvement there may be in sales execution today, and 
Maybe you can also touch on what your hiring plans are over the next year. Hi, this is Helen. Thanks for, for that, that question. Um, when I think about the, uh, uh, the continued pace for sales, uh, in terms of what we have the opportunity to do. I think from an execution perspective, um, the results speak for itself for this year. And where we're looking to accelerate our efforts will be along the lines of some of our solutions that right now we're seeing a lot of client demand for on ESG, on wealth analytics. Um, and what we're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, about our ability to expand with with our the wallet within the wallet share of our existing clients, I, I would expect to see that continue as well. And so what we've done is we're going to be planning on, you know, essentially focusing on premier type clients, our, our highest clients, uh, and including some that we'll, we'll think we can really continue to do that, that expansion on the enterprise uh, front. Uh, so from an execution perspective, those are the areas that I think we'll continue to expand on. But it really is building on the momentum that we already have seen this year. Thanks. And then from, from my follow-up, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of large M&A in the financial services space in general. Um, maybe you can just talk about what your willingness is to participate in any of the larger M&A. And, and specifically, are there any synergies with assets that are currently not in your portfolio today? Um, and then is, is there, are there any significant scale advantages um, today that you might be lacking? Oh, well, I think our answer has been consistent regarding M&A. So we're, um, you know, we we feel that we have the scale we need. Uh, we're one very well-integrated platform, and we're very good at doing tuck-in acquisitions for uh, unique content and technology, which we uh, demonstrated this year. So we're really happy with our platform and our ability to uh, be a central player in the ecosystem uh, and be really agnostic to the data that's on our platform, whether it's ours or us integrating third-party content. Uh, we do have a very he healthy balance sheet, and we've said historically that if the right uh, transaction comes around that's larger, you know, we're in a position to execute on it. Uh, but we don't feel that it's something we need to do to be successful, and we've demonstrated that this year. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, next question coming from the line of Alex Graham with UBS. Your line is open. Yes. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry if I missed this um, in your prepared remarks, but can you just talk about the outperformance on ASV in the fourth quarter? I mean, obviously, you had some guidance out there that you gave us just a couple months ago, and then I would say you beat that by, I don't know, 25 or so million dollars. So just wondering if there was anything chunky, maybe not repetitive, um, that, that you would call out um, that, that we may have missed, and because that obviously creates a tougher comp for for next year. Well, like some quarters, Alex, we do have uh, you know some large wins. So we did have very one very good win on the wealth side, uh, and we had ver one very good win on the um, data partner side. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't have these types of wins in in future quarters. So that certainly helped uh, getting those done. Uh, but again, I think just uh, excellent execution from the sales team, uh, really closing out the year uh, in dramatic fashion, uh, and and capitalizing on those market trends that we spoke about earlier. Okay, no, no, that's that's helpful. Just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything super chunky, but it seems like two larger things. And then just as a follow up to a question earlier, I think you said that you think the environment added about a third of the growth. So I guess a little bit over. 2% or so. So I guess as we look into 2022, what type of environment is kind of factored into your guidance from a from a overall industry perspective? Because you can't ignore, as, as you as you said yourself, that it's been uh, that there's been a lot of tailwinds in capital markets that that have helped you. So just just curious, what you expect if, if you expect us to persist, or, or what kind of environment we should be thinking about? So just to be clear, I would say a third of, you know, the outperformance uh, versus our guidance was due to those trends, not a third of our overall performance as a company. Um, and as I mentioned in an earlier question, you know, the buy side is setting up very nicely for us next year. We see a very healthy pipeline, uh, good trends on the buy side. So even, you know, even though there are some tough uh, conditions out there for asset managers, our investment in our platform, our content, opening it up, really allow us to 
take market share and really help them with some of their challenges, which is managing data better, which CTS does a great job of, uh, and then really being plug and play in terms of their workflow solutions. So we feel good about the buy side going into next year. Of course, uh, continued health on the sell side will help us, but we don't need that to be successful and to, to meet our guidance. Oh, thanks for clarifying. Take care. Sure. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Andrew Nicholas with William Blair. Your line is open. Hi, this is actually uh, Trevor Romeo in for Andrew. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I was just kind of hoping you could provide an update on the selling environment and how um, sales cycles have evolved in terms of, you know, length and complexity. Have you seen any changes in the speed of client decision-making lately? Hi, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. So I think one of the um, other points that helped drive our outperformance was uh, our analytics business, which which uh, accelerated, and some of the deals that perhaps had taken a bit longer uh, really coming to fruition. And we continue to see that as we think about, uh, look at the pipeline going forward. So I don't think I would say there's wholesale change yet in terms of the decision-making. That really is case by case. But I will say that as we settle into uh, much more so of the virtual environment, clients are clearly focused on their own digital transformation and the need to uh, to improve, uh, and as a result, some of the things that we've had for a while that got pushed uh, were realized, and we'll continue to see that going forward. Okay, great. And then uh, just in terms of the, the deep sector content investments that you've been making, I uh, was just wondering if, if there are any particular sectors or industries uh, where you've kind of seen the strongest uptake at this point, and then going forward, which ones you might expect to see the most investments? Thank you. Yeah, so we've, um, I think the three that we have released um, are, you know, financials. Um, we've done some good work in insurance, uh, real estate. So we're seeing really good usage across all of those, uh, and we're beginning to make progress on some of the other sectors. So I'd, I'd say it's pretty broad-based there. All right, thank you very much. Yep. Our next question coming from the line of, George Tong with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Good morning. I wanted to follow up on the components of AFC growth in fiscal 2022. You've had several larger wins in 2021 and also some larger legacy cancels. So as you look ahead to fiscal 2022, what kind of AFC growth do you expect across your realigned research analytics and CTS businesses? I don't think we're giving explicit guidance there, George, on, on those three uh, business lines, but I would say it's well balanced between all of them. Uh, CTS, um, I would I would expect, will continue to have a high growth rate, uh, just given the trends in the market and the opening up of the platform. Uh, analytics, as I've mentioned, um, is setting up well uh, versus last year, and not a lot has changed in terms of the components of that business line. And we're very optimistic about research, but just based on what we've seen, you know, over the last year and our ability to close new logos and meaningfully increase uh, the number of users of FactSet across a lot of different firm types. And, George, I would take a look across the geographies as well. I mean, if I look at the pipeline, uh, quite frankly, Americas, which has been very strong in, in 2021, we expect to have that have continued strength, but we saw double-digit growth in Asia Pac and, and, and Europe ticking up as well. So I think it's really quite broad-based. I think it's what gives us um, not only uh, a, a lot of uh, pride of what we've just done, but also the confidence as we go forward, which is reflected in our guidance. Got it. Very helpful. And then uh, on pricing, what, what kind of pricing assumptions are you, are you reflecting in your guide and, and how much do you expect pricing to go up by uh, in the forthcoming year? particularly as you think about how much competitors are raising their prices by. So are you, do you think you're raising prices in line with the competition ahead of or below the competition for next year? Sure, I'll, I'll, t I'll take that one as well. I mean, we, we, we were very, um, we could see that our clients value our products by what we were able to capture this year, and we'll continue that into next year. I think we'll be in line with many of our, uh, our competitors as well. Uh, so we would expect to see that similar impact, um, if not more. Uh, we've spent a lot 
in enhancements uh, in the uh, the value that we can clearly tie back to uh, to what we've done for, for for them. So, so George, I would expect to see it in line in uh, not only in the market but in the previous year. Very helpful. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Patrick O'Sullivan with Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. In terms of your momentum with sell side customers, to what extent would you ascribe that growth to new customer wins or new product sales as opposed to your existing customers growing their headcount? Hey, Patrick, it's Phil. Um, so just in terms of new logos, uh, we did better this year on the sell side than we did last year. I think we were actually down in terms of new logos on the sell side, and we were up this year. So we're certainly adding new clients, and some of that, as you can expect, is being driven by just the investment that we've made, particularly in the content area. Okay. Um, and then I guess speaking of the headcount theme, uh, FactSet's headcount growth has slowed. I think it was 4% in the fourth quarter year over year, uh, I think closer to 3% X acquisitions. Was that an intentional deceleration of your headcount growth, or does it reflect challenges in terms of hiring and retaining talent in this environment? Well, I think we've done very well in terms of uh, the employee value proposition at FactSet over the last year. We've done a lot to really make sure that our employees feel um, like they're taken care of, that they have flexibility in terms of how they work, uh, and so on. So I think we've, we have a lot to be proud of there for our, for our employees. Uh, like lots of firms, right, we're going to be faced with um, – a lot of movement, I think, uh, on the talent side. We believe that creates a good opportunity for us uh, in the marketplace. We think we'll be able to, you know, retain the talent we need at FactSet, but also attract uh, some really good new talent to the company. Um, so, you know, I think we're probably in line, frankly, in terms of what we planned in terms of uh, headcount growth there. I don't know, Helen, if you've got anything you wanted to add. Yeah, no, and I, th I think what we've seen is our, in our own productivity and efficiency improvements as we've gone through. I think we've talked before around workforce mix. If I take a look at where, while our headcount has um, uh, gone up, uh, the mix of that is also quite key. And uh, and then when we talk about the operating leverage or our labor productivity, you've seen that come, come through as well. And, and please note that, especially since we've invested quite a lot in the technology front, that is meant to help us in terms of uh, having the type of work that our folks do. So I wouldn't necessarily look at people count as the driver here when you think about our uh, opportunities going forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, next. Now, next question coming from the line of Owen Lau with Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, going back to the driver of CTS, uh, could you please remind us some of the use cases of CTS? And as this segment continues to evolve, do you see a scenario that customers will like mostly need API and data fits, um, but not so much on the desktop, or they will still come hand in hand because desktop can still provide a good distribution channel to, uh, to customers? Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, the, you know, traditionally, FactSet has um, sold a lot of data workflow solutions through CTS um, to quants, uh, but that's not the only workflow that we've sold to. So we still do very well um, selling to quants, but we're also thinking about how do we expand our market share by getting into more workflows across the middle and back office. And as we've opened up our platform and invested in new content, um, it's created some great opportunity for us to help clients manage their own data with our entity data map and our concordant services. You know, managing data um, is expensive, and FactSet is really expert at that. So that is one area that we're seeing really good growth from, particularly as we make those services available through new channels, uh, such as, uh, you know, cloud providers that we already spoke about. Uh, we've done traditionally well with performance workflows as well. This was a very good year for us uh, with our benchmark data feed. So FactSet does a lot of work to integrate all of the different benchmarks and indexes that are out there that feed into a client's own performance system. So that could be our own performance system, uh, but we're not the only performance system out there. 
Um, and so there are lots of opportunities here. You know, real time is another opportunity, sort of that trading workflow. So as we've developed more of our own capabilities there, we, we view that uh, as a good opportunity. I know, and just to add to that, when we talk about the sell side, Phil alluded to this to, to, uh, before, the growth there is also on the feed side. And so we're seeing, uh, interestingly, that being a driver for our, our CTS business. So I think that's a, an important piece to uh, consider as well. Just to finish off your, you know, your second uh, point there is a valid one. We do think there's going to be a very he healthy balance out there for how people want to consume uh, value. So it could be through a workstation or a web where we tee up the next best action for a particular user. But increasingly, uh, firms are going to want to consume data in new ways as they uh, analyze things in new ways. And that could be just a research analyst deciding they want to you know, program in Python or use Tableau or some other um, types of um, systems to, to, to sort of do their analysis. So that it, it could be the same type of user, but through a different workflow, or it could be just feeding uh, directly into a system that a client has, like a CRM. Got it. That's uh, extremely helpful. Um, and then uh, going back to the research, I think we, we touched on a lot about the growth there, but there are lots of news out there that many investment banks are raising the salary of the junior bankers on the banking side. Do you see like in terms of the new, is there any like additional subscriptions from these clients? Do you think uh, they also increase the hiring and facts that can benefit from that as well? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's what we just saw in, in Q4 is we saw the banks, uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you know, hi hire a lot of new talent. Uh, and, and when that happens, you know, very often facts that will just get deployed automatically onto those desks. But I think also in addition to the, the number of, uh, of analysts, to your point, Owen, uh, what they're looking for is to be able to provide their um, analysts the tools that are needed. And I think that's what we're finding, and that's why I think our retention has grown, has improved as well. Uh, what we're finding is getting the tools of FactSet to the analysts to allow them to do their work in a more efficient way so they don't not spending you know, 100 plus hours. I think all of that uh, comes into play. Got it. That's my question. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next question coming from the line of David Chu with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so you highlighted strong performance from the sales teams throughout the call. Um, Helen, are there any key changes to the strategy since you took on the new role? Yeah, thank you for thanks for your question. Um, one of the things, quite frankly, is is how proud I am of the fact of how we have executed, and uh, and I think the areas of focus, if anything, is more of an enhancement at this at this juncture. I think what we will focus on is our go-to-market strategy. I think we will focus more on driving the enterprise discussion with senior client executives. It really allows us to uh, and provide uh, our platform for their own digital transformations. Um, and in terms of major changes, I would say, you know, no other than really, again, enhancing on the areas that we think we can um, leverage across the firm types or, quite frankly, operationally where we can provide them more bandwidth to spend more time with clients. Got it. And then, and then just on the wealth side, um, are there any meaningful RFPs coming up, let's say, in the next 12 months? And, you know, how would you characterize characterize your win rates now when you go into these RFPs? Yeah, we're not going to we're not going to comment on that, but there is I think a steady uh, drumbeat of these opportunities coming through, you know, each year. Uh and you know, we do exceptionally well when we get into an RFP just based on the product we have and the and the legendary facts at service. Those are two things that really give us an advantage uh when we're competing for those businesses. Okay, got it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next question coming from the line of Keith Hosom with North Coast Research. The line is open. Two more guys, and congrats on a great quarter. Um, you know, so just looking at the, the the pipeline that you guys have talked about in the past as being, you know, fantastic. I remember back to the last quarter. How would you talk? How would you characterize the pipeline coming out of the fourth quarter compared to, I guess, the third and second quarter? Well. 
the way that I would look at that, um, Keith, is just sort of versus the first half of last year. Um, and, you know, we got off to a pretty rough start uh, last Q1. You know, we, we were definitely digging out of a hole there and just came storming back uh, in the last three quarters. So as I, as I mentioned already a few times, um, the first half, which is typically the, you know, the, the period that we have the most visibility on, um, is setting up quite nicely, particularly on the buy side uh, with the analytics team. Great. And if, I talk, if we talk about the growth that you guys are experiencing, would you talk about it as more a market share gain or more an expansion of your overall uh, product set and expansion of the overall market? It's a combination there. I think we do very well uh, competitively, and our strategy, we believe, is differentiating in terms of opening up the platform uh, and investing in new content sets and being neutral um, in terms of you know what data we provide the market. So that is resonating particularly well with our clients as they try to differentiate themselves and become more efficient. Uh, and yeah, you know, and we get a lot of um, we get a lot of upside from expanding clients when we. We continue to build out our solution. Our clients trust us, and we've got great service. And uh, when, when trends are good like this in the market, we're able to really capitalize on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next question coming from Delana Craig Hoover with Huber Research Partners. Delana Selpin. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, my first question, as you remember, two years ago, you guys put a three-year investment plan and stuff with, I guess, on the back end that you were expecting to be able to get to high single-digit uh, ASV uh, growth on the back end of that. Um, is that still the plan here a year out, or has it been pushed out some, as you've alluded to in prior calls because of this pandemic? Um, thanks, Craig. Yeah, well, so we're entering the third year of that original three-year plan, and I think you can see our performance this year and what our guidance is for next year. So we certainly... High single digits is certainly something that's achievable. Uh, I believe back then we articulated that we would exit the year with a 33% margin, which is, uh, I think, I believe the middle of our guidance here for this year. And, you know, our aspiration was to get to double-digit EPS growth. I think if you look at the midpoint of our guidance, um, it's high single digits, but that doesn't mean, you know, if we execute well, we can't get to that thing. So I'm couldn't be prouder of our company. Um, we've all worked exceptionally hard over the last two years, and it's really great to see this level of performance, and we're really optimistic as we go into FY22. And then my follow-up, please, on the cost side related to that three-year investment program. I think originally you thought you were going to spend $15 million each of the three years. It's changed. Maybe if you could just update us on that, those numbers, please. I think it was higher last year. Do you have that number? Sure, I can I can talk broadly on on those on those points, Craig. Um, yes, I mean we, as discussed earlier, we are on target in terms of our plan. There are things that we probably accelerated in terms of spend, and in some cases where we've uh, adjusted along the way. That's what you would expect in a three-year plan. Uh, so, from a technology perspective, we probably spend a bit more, um, and we're able to uh, to to uh, make that up, as you can tell from our performance this year. Um, to go back a little bit to your point on the, us having pushed it out, I think what's really, I think, admirable is the fact that with, with uh, the situation that we had with the pandemic, we were trying to be as transparent as possible, and the fact that we were able to achieve what we have and what we're indicating for the third year really does mean that, we're, uh, uh, that we were able to meet what we had give, originally given guidance on. Thank you. I'm showing up for the questions at this time. I would now like to hand the conference back over to Mr. Phil Snow for closing remarks. Thank you all for joining us today. In closing, I want to reiterate how pleased we are with our performance this fiscal year. We also made substantial progress on our internal ESG strategy. Steps we have taken this past quarter alone include joining the UN Global Compact and Principles of Responsible Investment, publishing our global diversity figures, and committing to becoming MLT Black Equity at Work Certified. In addition to completing our sustainability plan, which outlines our ESG goals and aspirations. I'm very proud of all facts that has accomplished this year, and we look forward to speaking with you again next quarter. In the meantime, please call Rima Haida with additional questions. Operator, this ends today's call. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.